What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome to another episode of The Dig, where we talk about volleyball, training, and life, and dig deeper into the life behind the person. And we have a very, very special guest today. This is Coach Kevin Hambly, who is the current uh, Stanford women's head coach. And uh, if you've been following collegiate women's volleyball, you'll know that Stanford won two national championships in the last two years. And this is his only third year at the helm. And he was also the former head coach at the Illinois University or University of Illinois of Urbana-Champaign from 2009 to 2017, and where he helped them achieve their first NCAA finals appearance. And he was also named the Volleyball Magazine National Coach of the Year. He played at BYU for the men's team from 1992 to 1995, where he led the nation in blocks. So that's probably why Stanford has such dominant middles. And they used to run slides back in the day, right? Uh, I mean, I ran a slide, yeah. <laughs> I, we, we didn't have a lot of offense my senior year, and uh, we had to figure out ways to score, so I ran a slide, yeah. So I had to open it up. Yeah, for sure. And then after his collegiate career, he also played professionally in France and he was an assistant for the U.S. team for some time. So a very, very broad uh, volleyball experience. Um, so before we get started, uh, we usually try to start out with a quick set just to kind of ease into it. So it's mm. 10 questions, and it's more like a stream of consciousness response. Okay. So try not to think too much, and Easy. then just, just say what goes in mind, yeah. <laughs> especially during the off season, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, ready? Yep. All right, favorite food? Uh, pizza. Favorite movie? Uh, Seven Samurai. Favorite book? Oh, God. I, um, if I had to pick one, uh, Dostoevsky's Brothers Karmazinov. Man, that's pretty deep. <laughs> uh, uh, Mol Molten or Mikasa? Uh, Molten because it's NCAA ball. That's the ball we use. Favorite volleyball player? Favorite volleyball player? Uh, I honestly back in the day it would have, it would have been um, Boss Van de Gore was my favorite player. Boss, I haven't Vandegor. thought about that in a long time. <laughs> but yeah, I mean that was like growing up, my favorite player by far. Is that a U.S. player? Nope, uh, Dutch national team middle blocker. Uh, when uh -huh. they won the gold in '92, he mm -hmm. was seven foot, but the guy could have he would have been an opposite now and been insane. He was insane. Okay. He did quicks cool. out of the back row. He was. Look him up on YouTube. The dude was gnarly. He played with Zorver, Ron Zorver, who was at Oregon State. That team was stacked. Man. Beat Italy in the final. They were, it was, I mean, that was my era of watching volleyball. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's who you look to. After that, I've been a coach. I wouldn't I have my favorite kids to coach, but I wouldn't say I'm my favorite volleyball player. Okay. You know, I love watching some guys play now, but I, Boss Vandegor is my favorite player of all time. That was the air, that was the first tall setter right there. And the Dutch setter was six eight. Yeah, Peter. Uh, uh, well, I thought his name was Tandy or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago. Blanche, 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 Blanche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he actually was a national team coach for a while. So yeah, man, you're pulling some recesses out. I haven't thought about this in a long time. <laughs> I love that team though. I love that team. Yeah, I, it's uh, Numidor. I mean, they have some guys that transitioned into beach too after they retired mm -hmm. from the the indoor game and okay. did pretty well there. Yeah. Um, all right. A couple more questions. Favorite volleyball coach? Carl McGowan. Favorite non volleyball role model? Uh, I mean, probably Benjamin Franklin. All right. Favorite volleyball position? Uh, that's a hard one because there's so many different layers of that. My, I, liked, uh, I like playing middle the way I played middle where I got to hit on the right side, hit D balls and be okay. out of the back row and play all six rotations. So I love that. Hit quicks, hit D balls. It's, a, it's out of system D balls. That was a good deal. Now mm -hmm. I couldn't say that playing middle would be my, I would, I'd probably try to play a different position or play a different sport, to be honest. I can't imagine uh -huh. only playing three rotations. That would be awful. <laughs> back in the day when you played six rotations, I mean, who doesn't like hitting quicks, man? You just get up yeah. and whack a quick in space and then hit, I got the out of system stuff with the D balls. Otherwise, uh, setter is my favorite position to work okay. in. So for all the, the young fans out, the, the, the pre-libero, the guys are, were born after the libero, 
Yeah. Um, the middles, especially after they ran out of subs, had to play all the way around. But they usually were the big guns. They didn't have uh, subs. They didn't yeah. have subs back then. We had six subs, you know, like they do in the men's game. So you had one DS maybe come in for in and out for you to serve. And I mean, we had to serve, receive. We had to play. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeff Nygaard was a uh, a great back row attacker. He would have been a D liner. You know, coach at SC now. Yeah. He was an incredible middle blocker and was a great uh, their best back row attacker. Yeah. And I don't. I think no no middles are doing that now. You know. So go ahead. Ryan Millar might have been the last. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's not, no coincidence that he set the gold medal point. He set yeah. Clay Stanley. Yeah. He had, no, to, he had to do He replaced me as middle at BYU, and that was a huge upgrade uh, when <laughs> Ryan went there. But, uh, no, he was – I mean, the game was different back then. You had to play the whole game, and he was a great – he's a great volleyball player. Forget about just being a middle. Although I saw uh, Gemma at UCLA hit some balls out of the back row. He did some funny stuff with their libero, and libero their opposite, and had him hitting some balls out of the back row. Um, Looked like John was kind of going throwback on that deal. He's gone throwback yeah. on the old school six two, and then throwback uh-huh. with the middles out of the back row. So I was I was interested to see how that kind of played out, but they they seemed like they abandoned it after a while. So yeah, I think uh, Gemma struggled with some of the out of system tempo since he's just used to just going. Even though he had a huge window, um, I mean, it's as big as I've seen guys in Arley. Yeah, they'd still kind of do it at the international level occasionally. Um, Sokolov, I don't know if you know who that is. He's oh, the yeah. Bulgarian. Um, when he first started his pro career in Italy, he did front row, middle, back row, opposite for two or two and a half rotations, right? Yeah. And he was just such a physical specimen. So that's fun. I mean, I, the, one of the most incredible matches I've seen was that was it uh, two thousand and four? Was it four? No, it was, it was twelve when the Russian team put Mazursky in the opposite. Oh, two thousand twelve. Twelve, yeah, and just. I mean, I know eight we won, so that's an easy one for me to remember. So it was 12 when they when they put their middle on the opposite and he just went off with 26 points or something in three sets. And it was yeah. good It was good for the middle's heart to see that. <laughs> get that many swings, get a middle, see the middle get that many swings. But no, I watch, you, we watch, we, I watch a lot of men's matches. I watch okay. as many men's matches as I do women's matches for sure. There's some interesting things going on in the men's game for sure. Yeah, I do notice the, the style that you've coached. Uh, when when John Dunning was at Stanford and having the chance to observe him and pick his brain a lot, he was very, very about percentages, managing risk. And I remember even when he would run the D ball with Haley before she got injured, uh, I was asking, why don't you run it on the six foot line, get a more aggressive attack? And she's like six, five. He said, well, you know, it's just a higher percentage move to set it on the nine to 10 foot line as, and it allows her to maximize her reach. So, I mean, obviously very successful there. And yeah. how's your style is um, incorporating um, your, your outside on a lot of back row, like very quick, quick picks, and then running the D ball after serving rotation one. Yeah. That was, that we're, was interesting. We're doing some, we're trying to get that more integrated in our offense too. We have a kid that could play opposite. We'll see if she ends up playing opposite with Kendall Kip and mm-hmm. she touches 10, 10 or something like that. And she flies. <sighs> So we can yeah. kind of flip some stuff up. We'll see if we can get a, a true D-ball going. I mean, Hugh had a true D-ball going with Samity on the right side, but there's not a lot of teams that have that, are using the opposite, like the international system. And I'd like to. It'd be fun. All right. We got a couple more questions. Sorry. Um, yeah, I keep, I keep No, that's right. This. These are great tangents. It's very rare to be able to talk such a variety of volleyball with people. Yeah. I'm usually the the weird guy, even in the volleyball crowds, because not many people, not Amer- many Americans watch international ball. Unfortunately, you're right. Yeah. Or even think about stuff beyond just TV. All right, top spin ace or jump float ace? Uh, top spin aces. Yeah. And then last one, stuff block kill or bounce ball kill? No, stuff block. Stuff block. Stuff block is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thanks for getting that out of there. Um, yeah. And also now we'd like to hear about your story, kind of where you grew up, mm. how you got into volleyball, and just kind of your, your general journey to where you are now. Well, I, I grew up in uh, San Fernando Valley, then the Simi Valley. So that's, uh, for those that don't know, it's kind of close to Thousand Oaks, just over the hill from um, like Malibu, Ventura, Ventura County. Um, went to a high school called Royal High School. And I was really lucky that uh, I, I was a basketball player. My freshman year, I played tennis. Uh, I played a little bit of baseball, played a little bit of football. 
uh, volleyball was nowhere on my radar. And then um, I was playing with a few girls one time. And when I was like a, a freshman in high school, my mom picked me up and watched me play for a second. And she, then she heard there was these, and thought I was good. She mentioned something like, hey, you look pretty good. I'm like, it's volleyball, mom. I'm not, you know, I'm not playing volleyball. I'm a, I'm a you know, football guy. I'm a basketball guy. And uh, my school started a program uh, my, my, my freshman year. And my sophomore year was coming around and I was thinking about going back out to play some tennis or maybe playing some baseball. And my mom said, hey, why don't you go try out for volleyball? And I said, no, I'm not going to try out. And she said, what if I just, you just go to the tryout, just see what it's like. And, um, and I was like, no. And she said, what if I gave you a Georgetown Hoya hat? At the time, Alonzo <laughs> Mourning was a, and Dikembe Mutombo were these two centers. And I just liked that team. And I had every other team that I could want. Georgetown Hoyas was a hat that I wanted. And so she bribed me with the hat. I went to the tryouts and, you know, we did our warm ups and all that. And then we hit and uh, I jumped up and I hit a ball inside the 10 foot line and hit it hard. And um, everyone kind of stopped. And I didn't, I felt like happy Gilmore or whatever. And I was just like, you know what, is that good? I don't know. Like people were like, that's, that's great. And, you know, the, my, the coach pulled me aside pretty quick and was like, Hey, let's get you on this court over here and see you can handle the varsity. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm a volleyball guy. And I didn't really, play club until my senior year when I because I still thought I'd be a basketball player in college and I was kind of messing around with that and uh but then I played for Andy Reid uh club at uh at, well first I played for a club called Hodoli at uh James Park who was a coach at Kalalu for a long time Thousand Oaks High School and he really taught me a lot and then uh um uh, played for Andy Reid who was assistant coach at Pepperdine at the time but now was an assistant coach at Long Beach State and he really kind of expanded my game and then went to play for Carl McGowan and he was just, I mean, he challenged us in every way to be the best we could be. And I grew a lot as a human being and grew a lot as a player there and then went on and played pro and, um, you know, pretty quick. Uh, I had a decent year my, my first year in, in Montpellier, France, and I really enjoyed it. And then they traded my contract to a team in Italy, Fano, and I went there for about three weeks and uh, it was kind of an extended tryout. And, Next thing you know, this big Yugoslavian guy who's going to play for like a third the money that I was going to pay for is in the gym with me, and you're only allowed one foreigner. I kind of got the hint, so I just hopped on a plane and called my my indoor career over, and uh, was coaching club, coach at a high school, trying to figure out what my next move was. And Dieter Collins, who was the coach of San Diego State till recently, picked me up as a assistant coach for uh, I think it was twelve thousand dollars restricted earnings coach. And then the rest is history, UNLV, National Team, Illinois, and then here. So, um, yeah, I feel like I've been very fortunate that there's some, been people that kind of have given me opportunities, and I've just been lucky enough that they've worked out. You know, a lot of people that I've talked to, a lot of great coaches always reference Carl McGowan. Um, a lot of great coaches were came from his program, and um, he. I feel like he's the, the John Wooden of volleyball in terms of how he's inspired – I mean, there's been a lot of great tacticians, people that have won maybe just as many games, but I noticed that under his tutelage, a lot of coaches came out of that. Yeah. Uh, Can't you want to expand upon that as to why? Yeah, well, I mean, he he brought science to our sport, you know? So, I mean, he brought motor learning to the, to the sport. And like motor learning is is basically how you teach phys- how physical education, how you teach people to move properly. And, you know, he, I think before people were just trying to figure things out and, he brought that. I will say, I mean, he wasn't a great coach. He was a great teacher when I was there. And he really developed into a great coach. I mean, when I went there, it was the third year of the program. My first year was the third year of the program. And um, he was just figuring out how to be a coach, but he understood how to teach. And our team got better faster. And, um, and he used science and everything made sense that he, the way that he was teaching us. And so I think that all inspired us to kind of look to science to help us grow and get better. And um, he also was an incredible salesman of what he was teaching. You know, I think uh, he would always talk about, you know, he cures most and who most are trusting. And so that's a, that's a medical axiom. And he would always say, like, if you trust me, like we can basically, if you trust me, then I can teach you whatever. And he was really good about selling what, it, what we were doing in that moment. And that moment might change. So I remember one year, my sophomore year, we were very static in our blocking. And we're going we're gonna to read the whole time, and, um, but we're going to be very static. We're going to use a certain blocking move, and he sold it. And he was great at teaching it. And we, we all went 100% in, 
And then the next year it was like, nope, we're scrapping that. Now we're going to do this swing block thing. And he sold it like it was like both were the truth. And I think um, he did that because he, he understood it and he studied it and he used science. And then he was, he had great conviction in what he was teaching. And I think um, that lesson I learned from him, like if you're going to present something, don't be wishy-washy about it, but it like presented as like, Hey, here's what, here's what's going on. Uh, and here's how, you, here's the, the way that we want to play right now, understand it, have science to back it and then move forward. Um, but he just, he just inspired, I think a lot of us to look to science and um, to really uh, and love the game. I mean, I think I, I love the game when I left there. I love practice. I love playing for him. I love the guys. Uh, every single day we work our butts off. And my favorite thing about practice was, you know, back when we used to use ice a lot, putting ice on every part of my body and sitting there with the guys with uh, on the on the ice benches, just exhausted, talking about yeah. stuff that happened in practice. And I think that love came from how Carl worked us and how much we enjoyed playing together. Mm-hmm. And one comment that I see among a lot of great coaches is the desire to be lifelong learners in the form of adapting and evolving. So it makes a lot of sense that he would dramatically change his blocking schemes from one year to the next. And like one thing I've noticed, I recently had an interview with uh, Brett, who is the head coach of Archbishop Midi, um, yeah. usually a top state contender. And he always talks about every year, you're selling the experience and it's, it's interesting when he talks to some of the alumni, it's like they don't talk about the state title. They talk about the car ride home when they ate ice cream and they had these things and they're tired from all the games. And it's like, Oh yeah, we won, by the way, we won a couple of games along the way, but yeah, selling the experience and selling um, that those memories that I think people can really relate to and that creates lifelong learners. Yeah. Well, I would say the journey, the journey and all of these things are way more. I mean, so, I mean, we were fortunate. We were able to win a couple of championships here. And when we get together and talk, we don't talk about winning the championships. We don't talk about those matches at all. That's never even a conversation. That's never even a thought of a conversation because the reality is when you win after the moment you win, you wake up the next morning and nothing's different. Like nothing's uh-huh. changed. So what's really important is just the experience that led up to that, you know? And yeah, that's why we, we, when we are talking about even the, the upcoming season, we're not talking about wins and losses. We're talking about how do we perform at the highest level we can? How do we, how do we become the best team we can? How do we, how do we, like you said, sell the experience? How do we, how do we as coaches provide the best experience for our student athletes so they can thrive in our, in our culture and in our system? And so I think the, the rest of it is winning is a byproduct of that, you know? And um, so I agree with Brad on that. That's, there's no reason to, focused on wins and losses and no one wants to talk about that that's boring anyway (laughs) yeah very true Uh, so do you think if you extend your contract in Italy do you still think you would have continued with your professional career or was part of the reason why you left too was you realized that maybe going pro was not for you and you wanted to start coaching no I think well a couple things like um, I was I knew always knew in the back of my mind I wanted to be a coach like I used to sit with Carl and do scouting stuff. I want to learn about scouting. So I'd sit with him and we, I learned how to chart and I did things like that in his office. And um, so when I was in Italy and I'm playing, I was playing an A2 and I'm in the gym and I'm like, that's, that's the level I belonged at. I wasn't a, excuse me. I wasn't an A1 guy. I wasn't going to be uh, an Olympian, like as a, as a, as a player, like I was barely on the fringe of all that national team stuff. So I just wasn't going to be that. It wasn't, I wasn't blessed with those gifts, you know. I had a good arm and I was a good volleyball player, but I wasn't – I I didn't jump like you jumped, Donnie. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) But I could play. So I could have continued to play. I had a a job offer in Buenos Aires when I came back, and I could have went there to play and continue my career. But And for good money, for, you know, four times the money, if not more, than I was going to make as an assistant coach. But I was just like, what's the point? You know, what am I – like I I got to that that A2 and I was like, this is where I belong. You know what, I, in my mind, I always was driven to see how high a level I could go to. And I'm like, actually, I think this is the highest level I can play. And I think I'm, I'm at the max of my ability right now. I'm, and I'm content. And I, I lost that kind of um, drive to continue to push to be a better player. So I've just been playing to play. And that didn't really work for me. You know, like I didn't, I, in hindsight, I might have wanted to play uh, just to have experiences with travel and see different cultures and use it as an opportunity to do that. But I wasn't into that at that point. I was much more into 
um, I need a new, I need a new goal. I need a new something to push for. And so college coaching became that next new drive for me to see, um, you know, how far I could go in a new vocation and that, that and co and college coaching and the women's side was interesting to me. So you started out when you came back, you started coaching right away for high school and before mm -hmm. you transitioned to college. So how did you choose to pursue a collegiate coaching career instead of just staying at high school? Well, I actually just a guy named Bob Kelly who coached at Durango High School. He did a big Durango, uh, it was a big Durango high school tournament every year. And actually the first year that I coached with him, um, I was, he asked me to help out in the gym during the summers. And then I helped out a little bit with his club team. And uh, I was, he was, he got me into women's volleyball or girls volleyball. And um, I was learning about it and he, you know, he coached my, my wife at the time. It was a club called Nevada Juniors who won, I think, three straight national championships. And he was the coach of that team, and an wow. incredible coach. And um, I just ended up latching onto him, and we liked each other, and we got along. And then I actually went, and I was coaching with him, and then I left to go thinking that I'd be done. I went, I left to go play in Italy. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's not working out. So I came back, and I was kind of in limbo. So I helped him out, and then started coaching club with him. And then in that time, it wasn't like I was doing that to become a coach. It was just a high school coach. It was like, I don't have much else going on right now. I got to figure out my yeah. next move. Can you help me out? Sure. You know, I, we had money in from the year before, so we were comfortable. And uh, I'm going to figure out my next move and apply for some college jobs and see what happens. And then it just turned out that like, we could stay in Vegas and um, yeah, with because Teacher Collins was there in town. So it was just very serendipitous, to be honest, that it just all yeah. kind of worked out. Yeah. It's interesting. Another common thread I see is uh, we all kind of fell into coaching. Yeah. You know, we didn't. We weren't in high school thinking, "Oh, I love to play. I can't wait to be a great coach." It's someone asked you, "Hey, we need some help in the gym. You need a body ball handler," or and then you just like, "Yeah, I like this is great. Helping people and interacting yeah. with the kids and and laughing with them and making them sweat." I mean, so yeah, it's no, kind of interesting. I think I always had coaching in the back of my mind. My first experience was coaching a little junior high when I was in high school, I coached yeah. a, a seventh grade basketball team. And uh, it was, we, we had this group and we had this really good center. He was like, at that time, you know, he was like six, four as a seventh grader. So he was huge and he was the biggest guy in the league and probably the best player. And then he got injured. And when I fell in love with this, with coaching was when we had to problem solve and figure out a way to play and win with this group when we were, we lost our guy, you know? So yeah. then all of a sudden I had to like problem solve and I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. Like this is, you know, I'm not just, I'm not just copying what my high school coach was doing with me and putting him in some kind of motion or the flex offense or whatever. I'm going to, I got to be creative here. And we, we opened it up and we played more like actually what basketball looks like now. Where we had five guys on the perimeter and penetrate and kick and shoot threes. And it was really, really fun, you know? So then I'm like, Oh, this is great. And I kind of caught that bug with coaching. And so, then throughout the process of looking at universities when I was going to make my decision to go to go coach or go, go to play in college I wanted to be with who I thought you know the best coach was and that I could afford to go to that school you know Marv Dunphy recruited me and I would have liked to have played for Marv but um, Carl Carl was it was like they were equal in my mind those two coaches but um, BYU was $1,500 a semester and Pepperdine was you know $45,000 a semester so <laughs> that made that decision pretty easy you know yeah so, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Coach Marv, another person that mentored a lot of other coaches and inspired people to just be better people. Yeah. I remember um, I, I went to San Jose State University and played for the men's club team there. Mm. And I was just working at my regular retail job. And one of my friends who works as an athletic staff, this was in 2008, while I guess they were using our university to process athletes for the Olympics and allowing or opening up for training. And the men's team was practicing there. So I asked my boss, like, I, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's my, my friend can get me in the gym. It's a closed practice, but if, you know, just, I'm a junkie. So I got to find a way to get in there. So I went to the practice. I sat down, I'm like one of three guys and we're not supposed to be in there, but then they're not going to stop practice to tell us to go away. Yeah, yeah. So I'm watching. And then afterward I go grab my, my torrent ball from the, from my car, from my little hatchback. So the guys can sign it. And the first person that comes up to me, and I'm intimidated because I'm thought I'm thinking Marv is going to come up to me and say, "Hey, you're not supposed to be here. Get out of here, man." Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, the only person that told me is like, "What are you guys doing here?" Was was Hugh. Yeah, of course. 
because he's intense, right? And I totally get it. But yeah. Marv came up to me and he said, hey, thanks for being here. He handed me a pin of an American flag. I guess he walks around with just his pins of American flags. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I miss you for Austin Olympics. And then after that, all the other guys proceeded to come talk to me. And it was amazing. Like Lloyd Ball, Reed, Riley, they all said hi. Yeah. And I think it was just such a great culture. It, you know, the practices were completely different. They're, they're cussing, they're trash talking. I remember um, sounds like a men's practice. Riley Salmon, one of my favorite players, they were playing a out of system drill, bouncing the ball on the floor. They set a high ball and a triple block, and then Riley Salmon, before, during, as he's going up to hit, he's like, "I'm gonna go OT on these bitches." <laughs> and then so I'm thinking, oh, okay, I, I wonder how this guy's gonna be in person. Yeah, um, but that was just my little story of, of yeah. Marv. <laughs> he's a good dude. They're good dudes. Oh, I mean, they're yeah. all like. I think we're lucky in volleyball. They're just really good people. It's really a nice culture yeah. in general to be around. Yeah. 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 So why did you, when, you know, going into UNLV national team and then Illinois, you had a lot of success at Illinois, eight years and historical performances. So what was it like uh, taking on that program and leading it to their first national championship? Uh, yeah. The title match. Yeah, we didn't win it unfortunately, but lost to Mike at UCLA in the final. But um, we, um, so when I was with the national team, Illinois, my wife played at Illinois, and Don Harden reached out to us about coming out there to kind of. He see just was talking about get, helping the recruiting, and and he wanted. To, I went out and um, consulted a couple of times with some system stuff with him, and so we decided that. And I kind of looked at Illinois as it was, you know, it's in a great location. It's close to Chicago where there's great volleyball. It's a big university. They care about volleyball there. We always looked at it as a sleeping giant and so did Don, you know, and he thought that that was a program that could really take off. And so um, it was exciting to me leaving the national team. I was going to go somewhere. I didn't really want to go to some place that had, was just hundred percent established. I kind of wanted to build and, um, and, see go through the growing pains of that and understand but i also didn't think i would be building in the big 10 i thought more like somewhere in the wcc or big west or you know something like that that was my mind but this opportunity came up and um because my wife went there and she's from chicago we thought it'd be this would be a a good opportunity to um to kind of go be a part of this program and see if we can help it you know move further and we went there with the intention of being there just for a few years as assistant coaches and then go find a head coaching job. Um, about two years in, Don Harden said he wanted to retire, um, uh, you know, three years from then. And he, he wanted me to take over as the head coach. And so uh, we put five years as the assistant and built the program. And then that transition from that, from that fifth year to the sixth year was pretty, like it was, it was pretty natural to take over the program because slowly I'd taken on more responsibilities and we built, I was the head main recruiter and I was, he was letting me run the systems the way I wanted to. So it actually felt like in 08, before I was the head coach, I would say for all intents and purposes, except for dealing with administration, like in the gym, I was basically the head coach and running everything. So mm. it was a really natural progression, which very few people get the opportunity to do. Like yeah. usually you come in, you got to stir stuff up and you got to change things. Like here it was, a, it was a big change for the team when I came in. Just me and John are very different. The way we communicate is different. And, and both, I think, can work great, but it's – were different there. It was like a slow burn and a slow build. And so it worked out, but um, it was really fun and really rewarding to try to build that program up. And, yeah. uh, you know, we, we did it with little guys, like little, little athletes, like two five eleven outsides. And we just balled, played hard, created a great culture. And then we slowly started to add these, you know, more physical players. And um, we picked up Michelle Barch pretty early. Who's with the national team now on the women's side. And mm -hmm. um, she kind of, took us to another level and Colleen Ward and I don't know, things started to take off. It was really, it was a really rewarding and fun place to, to um, help kind of build a program. And uh, for us, it was just, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And that experience that attracted you to build a program and then eventually transitioning to Stanford where the program was already built. Yeah. How did you navigate, I guess one, how was, what was your reasoning for, leaving Illinois to go to Stanford? And then secondly, what was it like to have a completely different experience where it was a little bit more established? Well, you know, during along our way, um, 
there were some other opportunities that popped up, other jobs, and I wasn't that interested in, my wife and I kind of talked about the only, there's only maybe two jobs that I would leave for, and one of them was Stanford. And so when that up, just because I, I like the, we're trying to create something similar to Stanford here where academics are a big deal. Um, it's good culture, recruit, you know, really good kids. Uh, just, you know, I always kind of looked at that as a model of what programs are supposed to be like. We didn't, mm -hmm. no one transferred from Stanford. I had one transfer in my entire career at, at Illinois. I just wanted to like hang on to kids, take care of kids. I just, it all it kind of resonated with me even from afar what I thought Stanford was. And so Stanford was one of the few places that I thought I would leave. Uh, and then even when the job came, I wasn't sure that this is a place mm -hmm. I wanted to go. Um, not because it was established, but more just because it was like, we had roots there at Illinois. We, we, we liked, my wife had a, a, a great social um, group that she was a part of. Um, I, had, I had some friends, which is hard in this coaching profession to actually have some friends and all that. But I, yeah. we, had some, we had some people that we, we felt connected to that community. We loved what we built. Um, but part of the, one of the reasons I made the choice to come here, it really had nothing to do with like where the team was or was established. It was just, it was a, this is a great place to raise kids. And my kids were about to, you know, they're in elementary school and about to go to middle school. And I have a, I have a daughter who's on the spectrum and, you know, you're from San Jose. There's a thing called social thinking, which was established in San Jose, which is really, is an incredible, um, uh, I don't know, it's a um, tool for helping kids on the spectrum to navigate social cues and yeah. learn how to communicate appropriately. And uh, I mean, just to, to, to be able to um, live in the world without disruption as best as they possibly can, this world is not set up for them. And so for them to help navigate that. And uh, so when we started to look at all that kind of stuff, yeah. the real reason we came here was for that, you know, and then getting back to California. I mean, I'm outside right now. My friends in <laughs> Chicago and Illinois and, you know, Minnesota, it's freeze, it's 20 degrees. That was a part of it. But that was the least factor. It was more about our kids and their life right. and, um, and, you know, an opportunity at a place that's really, really special. And I didn't really realize how special it was until I was really here and in it, but it looked from afar like it was special, but it was much more about personal stuff than it was about the volleyball side, to be honest. And that's, that's a really great insight to hear. And we have a lot of coaches that, that followed my channel. And I think the biggest challenge that we all experience is how to prioritize family life. And it's really encouraging and inspiring to know that someone at your level, you know, top coach of the, of the college circuit is still thinking about his family. Um, Cause it's really easy to, to just expect people to follow you and to, to kind of just support what your role is. So I, I really admire that. Well, my, if you don't, you don't know my wife, but um, I'm following her. So like, that's, that's how it works. You know, she's our <laughs> de ops now, but no, I, I think, yeah, I think you have to take family into Now it's easy to say, Hey, let's, let's go um, Mary. Let's go to, for family reasons, let's go to Palo Alto, California. You know, I mean, that's, if I was saying no, no offense to, let me think of a place like Barrow, Alaska. I don't think there's a university there. I don't know that that would be the same move. So um, family certainly was a main factor, but it was a lot easier sell the fact that it was in Northern California. Although I will say my wife was really concerned about moving to California. She, what she knew of California was like real housewives of you know, Beverly <laughs> Hills or whatever. Earthquakes. And yeah. But like, but literally one month in, she just, we were having dinner and she goes, Hey, uh, you better figure this shit out here. Cause like, I don't want to go anywhere else. This is amazing. You know, I was uh -huh. like, yeah, I'm feeling the same way. So, um, yeah. yeah, anyway, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry no, to that, stick to that direction. No, that's, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, one of my good friends, um, his son has autism and just, he's a blown away at the community. He's involved in like three, there's like two Facebook groups that they meet with. There's organizations and just a lot of great resources and a lot of support in this area so it's you're in a really great place for that yeah we had a neurodiversity night actually um a match neurodiversity versus ucla where we didn't we played the music really low we had um sensory um mm -hmm. sensory sensory free zones we had headphones and sunglasses and just to try to make the experience better for those that are on the spectrum or have other um, neurodiversity uh, mm. issues and it was really cool it was it was yeah. a really really cool um, event and that's, uh, is that stanford is that stanford man yeah people got behind that which was really nice and we brought the people up from san jose and their honorary coaches the 
the person that started um, for us social thinking, which changed our life, really changed my daughter's life, um, was there sitting on the bench. It was really um, an honor for me, like to have the leader in this movement that really has helped millions of kids. Yeah, that's really awesome. I'm that's not cool. surprised a place like Stanford would would spawn an event like that. I mean, that's 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 very very Stanford. Yeah, it is very very Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> so when you applied for the job, what do you think that, I'm sure there's so many other applicants, um, what do you think that stuck out about you um, going into accepting, having them offer you the job for Stanford? Yeah, um, I think it was, I think it was our, the culture and the way that we treated the kids, the athletes at, at Illinois, you know, like the fact that we didn't have transfers and um, that we treated the athletes with the utmost respect and that we weren't using athletes to get wins. And, um, and you know, the, the way that uh, we operated with integrity the entire time, you know, and I don't think I've never, you know, I've never been accused of breaking rules. No one's ever called me and said, Hey, you're, you've been cheating. You know, I, I think I've, we've always operated with the utmost integrity and we've always operated with, um, the the kind of the mantra that this is about the athletes and it's not about you and uh, I think that's served us well and is one of the reasons that it's very Stanford as well like it's very much about the athletes here and it, to me it was very comfortable when I got into this into the gym with the athletes and we got around the athletic department just the culture that's here I felt like it was the culture that I like I mentioned it trying to try and implement it in Illinois and at Illinois there's great coaches and great people but I felt like we were a little bit of an what we were trying to do was a little bit more of an outlier where here it feels more like the norm. And yeah. uh, so it's just a really comfortable move for me. Uh, that's great to hear. And I think it's awesome that Stanford truly values that. I mean, it's, they have such a historical sports program in, in many aspects, but it's very obvious that almost every athlete and every coach that I've met at Stanford has the same, same values that you just mentioned and are very accessible down to earth. Highly yeah. intelligent, well-rounded, and and open, very very open-minded to just have a conversation. There's a there's a very um, really cool like humble achievement that goes on here at Stanford, where everyone's pretty humble, but they all are achieving this incredibly high level. And it's really yeah. refreshing to be around. I mean, I've I've met all these professors on campus, and they're doing these amazing things like changing the world, and they just would have a cup of coffee and talk to you like yeah. like this and it's, and there and you have no idea what's going on it's just it's a it's a really cool place it's kind of like i would say like in the in the movie the incredibles in the first one when he's trying to make everyone a super i don't know if you've seen incredibles but it's like when everyone's a super then no one is it's like here everyone's uh -huh. achieving at such a high level that that's just kind of the norm so it feels like no one's achieving at a higher level and it just yeah. kind of pushes everything but everyone's just this really really humble and really down to earth it's really cool it's really refreshing yeah and it's very Bay Area where you can find a CEO at a coffee shop wearing sandals and you think that they might be borderline homeless and you talk yep. to them, they're like a multimillionaire. Yep. But I, if I ever to wanted you. to talk to Cook from, uh, from uh, Apple, I can just walk right down the street. I know where he is every morning. <laughs> he's in the same coffee shop. I won't sell him out, but he's in the same coffee shop getting the same coffee every single morning. So yeah. it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and, and he's really accessible. People come and start, sit down and have coffee with him all the time. I have oh, not man. done that, nor will I. So, anyway. <laughs> All right. Now on to some more Stanford volleyball tidbits here. Okay. Things I've been waiting to ask you for like the last two years, but I know you've been super busy. So I'm, once again, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, going into that first year and unfortunately getting knocked out, I, I did see some mm. video footage and interviews from the Stanford YouTube channel. So how much pressure if you did you feel any pressure coming in knowing that you guys just came from a national championship and you had pretty much the same very similar group and then how did you handle that pressure leading into your first year well i didn't um feel pressure there's pressure to perform everywhere you know i feel like there's pressure to perform in illinois I, that, that didn't feel that much different to me you know i think the thing that was different is that we were equipped and had the ability to to win the national championship but I also knew that, um, you know, everyone thinks that we returned everybody, all the same players from that 16 to 17. And we lost a lot. We lost two DSs. We lost um, Inky, who was like one of the most incredible oh, yeah. athletes I've ever seen. 
we lost Ivana, who was an outside on that team. So we were, we had to rebuild and then we had to um, reinvent the culture, you know, and mm -hmm. partly because I came in. And so we came in hoping that um, we could pull something off and we had an opportunity to. And, you know, I think I, to be honest, uh, the, I, I guess go back to the original, the pressure wasn't any different than it was in the other year that I've coached. I, you know, the pressure's coming internally. I didn't feel external pressure from anybody, just like I won't next year and I didn't this year. Um, we're just going to do the best job we can. But I think what we did culturally, what I did culturally was I was trying to reinvent the culture on the fly as we're going. And I don't think, I think one of the reasons why I, we didn't win was because I just didn't do a good, a good enough job getting to know the athletes and figure out kind of how to push the right buttons to help us have success. Our culture was not as strong as it needed to be. We were not close enough as a team. We weren't willing to hold each other accountable. And a lot of that was I was, because they had won the year before, I was reluctant to stir the things up that I wanted to stir up that I saw. And because I, I didn't know the athletes well enough, I didn't know how to kind of push those buttons and how to really help them along. And I, I'm not sure how I would have changed that or what I could have done. Um, I've talked to Moretta lots about that a few times, who was the senior on that team. And, you know, she's like, I don't know what she could have done either. But I still, I still regret that because it's hard when you have a chance to win, to not win. You know, we lost in five to Florida that year. And a lot of that was because I just, I didn't get us together soon enough. And mm. I felt like, but I also am not sure we would have won the last two years without that loss because we learned a lot through that loss. And um, we grew a lot through that loss. And we, I, I, I was better because of it because I made sure we hit the stuff that we needed to hit. Mm -hmm. So I know that makes sense, Donnie, but that's. No, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Appreciate, okay. appreciate the insight. I, I did notice a, 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 a Stanford's never been like a super raw, raw team every time I've watched. Um, but there was definitely a, a deeper intensity with how I saw your, your athletes compete in the last two years compared to that first year. And, you know, maybe, maybe part of that was just getting used to that transition for the girls, but yeah, it was, it was really cool to see that evolution. And I mean, yeah. the, the, and what's crazy is that it's, it's really just a, a matter of one or two rounds. So it's on paper, the differences aren't going to be super significant, but I think just sensing different body language cues, the way they, they engage each other, eye contact. I saw a big difference in that first year to the second year. So it was really cool. Yeah. We were certainly tied in together. And like, I think we were more honest with each other and mm -hmm. the team gets tight. I mean, this year we were, it was incredibly tight. It was, uh, yeah. it was, it was one of my, it was an experience I never thought I would have. Like it was just pure joy and love for each other. Yeah. And we're just playing for that. And, yeah. you know, winning or losing didn't matter, you know, but the, the margins are thin all the time. Right. I mean, the difference between the number of points scored in our final versus Nebraska is one. Mm -hmm. like it was one. We won overall by one point. So the margins are thin. And the same with the, the Florida match. I think it was, I think we might even have outscored them overall in that match, you know, like mm -hmm. our first two sets were tight and then we kind of, we beat them up in the next two, but, like the margins are just really thin and winning and losing is what happens. Like we all win and lose. It's like, what do you do with that? You know, but um, this last year uh, was really special to me just because of how, how much love there was for each other and um, how tight our culture was. And one of the things that you said, how, like how we competed and all that, one of the things that I was never comfortable with in, in 17 was the way we defended and how hard we played. And I think, that that was a thing you know morgan hens played hard all the time but the rest of us needed work and we were really committed to being a great defensive team and you know if you look at our team this last uh, last three matches that was the thing that really set us apart to me was our block and defense and how we competed in that way so mm -hmm. yeah, i still remember i think it was the the for your first championship at stanford um and i'm drawing a blank i'm trying to think of uh megan mcclure gets the out of system bump set right triple block yeah. and just goes for it and you just yeah. you could tell by her body language that i don't care what happens i'm going to do this and it just very process oriented right no no hesitation of is this going to work or not i'm just going to do it yeah um, yeah i mean i think i think one of the one of my coolest moments since you brought that up about that like uh jenna gray was asked what's the legacy she would want to leave at at stanford and it, her her comment was that you can you should just go for it and not worry about mistakes. She was she she meant reference a swing in the final, 
um, the ball came from like 20 feet off and Megan was yeah. at the 10 foot line and she just ripped it. She yeah. just went for it. And like that, I think that's like, you know, when people talk about having a growth mindset, that's become such a catchphrase, but they don't really understand what that is. Like what's a growth mindset. And, and at least the way we've defined a growth mindset is like work hard with intention and make mistakes, like push to make mistakes, like, and don't be afraid of those mistakes. And like, if you're not trying to play to the edge of what you can be, then you're not going to grow. And so I think, you know, like that's what Jenna was talking about. Like we want to, we want to be able to like be free to make those mistakes. And so we can grow. And, and that's how we become the best we can. And as a coach, when I heard that, like, I was like, that was my favorite moment. Yeah. Cause the message I've been trying to say for the last three years got at least to this kid, you know, at least this one understood <laughs> it. So, yeah. And I think Megan understood it on that swing. And that was her point, you know? So anyway. Yeah. And I think coming from a, a university that prizes academic prowess, performance, however you want to put it to such a high degree. And like I, I coach, or I, I used to coach at Mission San Jose High School where it's every kid is taking, you know, three honors classes, four AP classes. And I also teach there. And one of the hardest things to teach the, this specific student population is the uh, appreciation of failure as a necessary ingredient for success. And then that starts with re redefining the success, right? It's the process of learning and without maximizing your intent, like you said, of trying to do something better, you're, you're not going, you're going to play a safe route and you're going to have guaranteed results. But then with guaranteed results, there's a very, there's a ceiling that you can't yeah. never break through, right? You never get to realize your full potential, which is really the greatest experience. Yeah. Um, no, so. and that, I had really good. I mean, we had our, some of the best leadership we had, um, like Plummer, who was player of the year was adding stuff to her game every single year. And mm. she would have practices where she, you know, like Plummer, you got to hit line. Like you got to figure this line shot out. And she'd have practices where she would miss half of her line shots, mm -hmm. but she's still going for it because yeah. she wanted to grow and she wanted to learn, which was an incredible example. You know, like that's an incredible example when this, here's a player of the year that could play it safe and probably be player of the year again, mm -hmm. but she's going for it and try to add things to her game. And, and I think that that was a really, it's a really hard transition for a lot of our athletes, but we, you know, you, you have to create as a coach, you have to create a, a culture where, you when they make those mistakes you celebrate those mistakes and and yeah. that you you allow them to do that with freedom that they're of and with freedom of uh judgment where they don't they don't feel like they're going to be judged by their peers or they're going to be judged by their coaches for making those mistakes and so like if anyone would someone would go for something and it had good intention they were doing it as hard as they could and they make a mistake man i would be like that's the, that's it right there yeah. like that is that that is what we need to be the best we can be and you know, I think, I think for a kid like Megan McClure, um, it's really because cause she had that example with Plummer, it really helped her kind of expand her game and grow as it did for all of our players. It's really fun. It's really fun. We have a really fun gym. And right now, the bummer about this whole COVID thing was that our whole gym was bought into that idea. Wow. And there's a lot of errors going on in their gym, but they were, man, they're going for it. And yeah. um, I think we're all disappointed It's because we thought we could make some really good progress before the fall with, a, with yeah. a whole new group but you know we'll still we'll still get the most out of the moments that we have the time we have as we get back in the gym whenever that happens yeah yeah that's that's awesome that um you even have that type of culture and creating a safe environment for your your student athletes to make mistakes and to continue to encourage that type of process learning now, how much of that was influenced from last year's or last season's preseason where I know you scheduled a really tough uh, preseason and yeah, the volleyball college community was talking about, you know, what does this mean for Stanford? They're struggling. Or as I saw it as this is your time to really expose what you need to work on, try things against, does it work against some of the top competition? And that obviously planted some incredible seeds for a dominant run um, yeah, in we, the NCAA tournament. I mean, we, I, I like the movie Fight Club. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but like one of yeah. my favorite lines in that is like, what do you know about yourself until you've been in a fight? Like you don't know mm -hmm. anything about yourself until you've been in a fight. I'm bad with quotes, but you get the, con the concept, something like that. And so I, like I wanted, and I do want our team to be exposed every year. And um, our goal is to go undefeated in the last six matches, right? So like if, if we're not being exposed, if we're not playing the toughest competition, if we're not um, getting, losing matches or losing sets, uh, then we're not being pushed enough 
to figure out what we need to work on and how we need to get better. And, and we're not growing as fast as we need to. And so I will always schedule really, really tough. I and mean, our schedule for the next four years, I mean, this year is going to be just throw the schedule out the window. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be, we're going to play Texas every year. We're going to play Minnesota. We're going to play Nebraska. We're going to play Penn State. We're going to play Florida. We're going to play uh, Kentucky and Louisville. We're going, to just, we're going to go for it, you know, And because I want, I don't care if we go five and five or four and four or whatever that is. I, it's not about that. It's about how do we become the best team we can and get to work. And so um, I think that's different. And I don't listen to anybody else about like the volleyball community. I don't really, I don't have, I don't have Twitter and I don't have, Facebook and I don't have any of that stuff and I don't look at the volley talk stuff. So I don't really give a shit. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. I don't really care about any of this stuff. Uh, and so I just, we do what we think's right with the program yeah. and we push it and the team knows what we're getting into and they embrace that and the losses are chances to learn. And that's what we talk about and we grow. And that's a, that's a real growth mindset, not yeah. trying to win as many matches as you can. A real growth mindset is challenge yourself as much as you can push for it, make mistakes, learn from them. That's a real growth mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in the Bay Area, this is so many startups coming along and, and failure is kind of part of our DNA. So it's, it's really cool to have that as a surrounding, I guess, global support and mentality where these kids are coming from. And they kind of know that being in the Bay Area, that's just how they do things, too. I mean, it is a challenge, though, to have, like you said, with your guy, like your school. I mean, all of my athletes did the same thing. They could all have gone to your school, right? Like, yeah. I mean, they're all have taken the four APs every the last two years of their high school and only honors classes. And it is, it's a challenge. Like I think that's one of the, one of the newest things is like teaching these guys. It's, it's okay to, to fail and yeah. to let go and fail and failure yeah. is part of growth, you know, and think back to when you first passed, you were terrible. Like, and you grew from that. It's the same yeah. thing. It's just now it's, now it's about hitting the shot or it's about adding this little, this part to your game or, um, expanding your range as a as a passer, expanding your range. So learning a new technique, all that stuff. But it's there. There's a like Carl had to sell me on things. We have to sell them on that, you know. Mm-hmm. Or I would say educate. Sales not a not a great term, but educate them about how to how to manage all that because it's hard yeah. for them. Yeah, one of my favorite analogies to give whenever I get like a, a very athletic player that's used to, let's say they're used to arching the back and using all pike for sp- spiking versus rotation and torque. And how they've, it was like, well, they usually say, well, I've already had a lot of success with this way. It's like, well, if you had a little brother or sister and they have to shoot a basketball granny style, you know, underhand, yeah. and they want to play in high school, are you going to let them do that? It's like, well, they're going to miss a lot of shots this way because they don't have the strength. But if they want to play at the next level, make hundreds of mistakes this way. And eventually you're going to double your range, right? Right. And your, your ability to shoot. Right. And I don't know if you've ever had this response in your gym with the uh, the AP honors population. Uh, one one time, I was asking one of my athletes. It was game point, and it was a good set, and she was hitting well, and she tipped. And I was like, "Okay, we lost the game." I had to talk to her. I was like, "Well, I'm curious, why did you tip out in that moment?" Usually, I'm expecting. I was afraid to make a mistake. It was a high pressure. I was like, "Okay, we can work through that." But being a mission kid at my school, she's like, well, at that time, the set was a little off by a few inches to my left. I thought the percentage of winning the play was by keeping it in and tipping it here. It was just so calculated (laughs) that the the risk was a lot lower here. And if I swung at it, you know, my body was in the right position. My mechanics weren't there. And it's just calculated. They're way too analytical. Like a lot of my athletes are very analytical. And I think for us, like you got to find the, like that's a good superpower, but we got to use it the right way. Right. I mean, that when you're in the middle of a play, uh, you don't need to be thinking that much, but yeah, for sure. We've had, I've had similar conversations (laughs) with my guys. Yeah. They're awesome though. So in in your experience, since you're such an avid watcher of men's game too, and then coming from the men's game, what differences and similarities do you observe between coaching men's and women's volleyball? Well, I mean, volleyball is volleyball. You know, I think they're, as far as like the mechanics of it, how you teach passing, how you teach defense, like um, even the way we run our offense with the exception of the slide, I'd say I was coaching the men's team. We try to play with the same tempo. We would, you know, maybe we'd use the D ball. The, the, the subs are different. So we'd have a guy hitting in the D ball, although I'd like to be able to play that way next year. Um, and so I think like you teach, you teach the game the same. I think where, where things change a little bit is, 
Um, the, the height of the net makes passing a little, a little different on the, on the women's side. It's just the angles of that are difficult, especially when you have six, six players that are jumping up, hitting nasty jump floaters that are really flat. Like um, the angles of that change a little bit. So that changes passing. But I would say in general, game's the game, you know, and you teach it. Mm-hmm. Teach the same mechanics. Um, where the men's game, I think, uh, is a little bit ahead. They are ahead on tempo and women's game is catching up. Um, they're, they're ahead with the back row attack where I think the women's game is going to catch that too mm-hmm. um, over the next four or five years. Uh, I would say the part that's most interesting to me about the men's game is how they play out of system now where mm-hmm. they're just firing balls up to the net and they're, it's a lot of open hand stuff and it's a lot of jams, yeah. it's a lot of wipes. And um, that's something that we've implemented with our team. If you watch us, I mean, you'll see Plummer – yeah, she whacks it when it's off a little bit, but when it's tight, she just put it, or, and Megan McClure, put it in the block, throw it off, or recycle, or jam the space. You know, I mean, they, both those guys are, I don't know, they each had in, in our final, I think, both of them had at least four kills off open hand, off speed stuff, and not like light tips over the top, top physical engage in the block, and then yeah. throw it off. And that's all from us watching the men's game. Even, even Fitzmaurice on the right side was doing some similar stuff where she recycled a couple times and then jammed one time um, where she got a couple points out of that um, playing like the men's game. I think they're ahead that way. And then mm-hmm. some of the moving stuff where the middles jump and float, we're trying to implement some of that with our middles. Um, we're just in transition between setters and we haven't been able to figure that out just yet. But I think that jump here, float there, jump here, float here. Yeah. And stuff, the men's game is doing a lot of that. And we did it a lot with Tammy Alade, mostly out of necessity. Well, and she was a freak of an athlete. She could fly. She was 10-10 too. And you could have her jump in the middle of the court and float to the three zone. And Jenna was really good at kind of moving her around. And so we did a lot of that stuff with her. But we didn't get that stuff going last year. And I would like to get that going more in the future. So I don't know if that answered your question. But that's like, I think the game is the game. I would teach the same, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I did see very athletic middle blocking, some slide blocking, one foot, um, a variety of it. And I know just coming from a middle blocker, you appreciate a lot of those. Um, yeah. But, you know, giving athletes the ability to to read, but then give them more tools to react in different tempos, different heights, uh, especially but, at the height. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I say tools and freedom. Yeah. And the freedom to go make plays. Like, just go make a play. Go be an athlete. You know, like, yeah. you teach the motor programs, and then in those motor programs, there has to be freedom of movement. And I think – that's some of the stuff that I liked about the way our medals blocked. Our, our medals were really good blocking at the end last year. And it was all, they were really free to, they're free to move. And they were going off one sometimes and going off two sometimes. And you know, it was like, it was like a one, one, two slide block and they're getting over. And yeah. we worked on that a lot. And like I say, we didn't work on it a lot, but they, they made it their own and they were free to move. And I think as coaches, sometimes we train the freedom of movement out of them. We have to give them good biomechanics, help them develop. We can't give it to them. We have to help them develop good biomechanics and then give them the freedom to move with those mechanics and mm-hmm. um, make sure they're sound and let them go. And I, I think that's what, you know, that's what we were trying to do. And I, I thought our middles did a nice job of kind of letting go and they were free and they moved free and they made plays because of it. Yeah, definitely. An- another tactical question I had on uh, watching Catherine Plummer. I'm curious, did you ever consider moving her to right side or having her have a passing right side? Because mechanically she seems to be more comfortable jumping more square kind of elbow high and not necessarily corked, cocked all the way back. Um, and back row hitting was super efficient, especially from when she was served, right? You'll keep her in um, the right back so she can hit some of those D balls. Um, so how much of that was just allowing your middles to be better off of one foot? Cause it looked like they were really good off of two feet too. Um, but I'm curious, did you ever consider moving Catherine Plummer as a hitting like right side so she can attack more D balls? We, we did. We looked at it a little bit, but um, with Fitzmorris, we wanted Fitzmorris out there. We like Fitz on the right. Um, Fitz, Fitzmorris is one of the best blocking right sides I've ever coached. She's mm-hmm. just exceptional over there. And um, no one on the left was going to be as good as Plummer on the left. And in our game, the game's won and lost on the left side. We played with her on the right a couple times um, when Fitzmorris was out uh, and Mutz was out. Loretta Letts was out. We tried it and we weren't, we just weren't as successful as we were when we had all those pieces in there and Plummer on the left. So, uh, yeah, did we look at it? Yes. But the team was better and she wants to be a left professionally. Mm. Okay. And so 
we wanted to help prepare for that. And we liked having her be a six rotation outside and pass and hit on the left. And we didn't have anyone else that we felt could carry that load and it made sense for our personnel. Mm -hmm. And Fismore, she did she come in as a trained middle? She was a middle, yeah. She was a middle her, my first year here too. Okay. We moved her to the right. Moretta Lutz was a middle too, but um, she played right the year they won it in 16. And then she was our right in 17. And we used her actually in one rotation to hit out of the back row, which was kind of fun. And she had a yeah. ball. And she was very efficient over there. But um, we were better with Kate Formico, who's one of the better passes on, the, on our team, mm -hmm. playing most of the time and, and keeping her out of there. Um, it just made sense to have Kate out there. And she's a great, she's a great BS. I mean, Kate's a great player, actually. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That, that makes sense. And so, yeah, we looked at it, but it didn't make sense for our team. You know, mm -hmm. it just didn't make sense for the person that we had. It didn't make sense for her future, what she wants mm -hmm. to do. Okay. And then that was one way to also to manage essentially three middles and get three middles on the court with the two you had. And then Fitzmorris running a lot of combinations, back ones, slides. Yeah, she was, I mean, she yeah. was, it's cool in transition when she defends the, when their right side attack comes versus our left side and she's covering tips. She can easily turn that into a slide you know, in yeah. transition, and that's one of her best attacks. And yeah. there's a lot of things we liked about having Fitzmorris on the right side. But yeah. mostly, um, she was super efficient. I mean, she had 330 over there or something for her career. And then she was a great blocker. I mean, yeah. we just matched her up on best best player over there and mm -hmm. best left and just said, good luck, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right. A few more questions here. Sure. So going from your second – championship to the third one the common question is always you know how do you keep a team like that motivated when you when you lead them to back-to-back -back titles so how did you coach them say the same or differently from the second from uh, the first title to the second title um you know we embraced that there's going to be high expectations on that and then talked about just letting it go and being in the moment that's in front of us you know i think we read a book we did read a book called legacy um, which is a which is about the All Blacks, and mm -hmm. you know it's all about culture and all about I don't know the kind of stuff we've been touching on. You know, it's about like how do we treat each other, how do we communicate. It's not about wins and losses. Like wins and losses mm -hmm. are a byproduct of that. And so we read that book together, chapter by chapter, and then talked about it. And for us, I think that helped us just stay focused on being process oriented and. You know, they, they knew, the team knew that there's all these different paths. The first year, I think they lost eight matches and won a national championship. And then the one we won in um, 18, we, we lost one match and won a championship, you know, all year. So, like, it could be anywhere in between, and it doesn't really matter. Like, it's just like, let's just be in this moment and be the best we can. And then, honestly, things that kind of, kind of with Plummer getting injured and then Fitzmorris was out, and then um, Kendall Kipp, who was our freshman, who's going to be a stud, was out uh for a while we it, you know the expectations kind of were put on hold because we're just trying to scramble and be the best team we can and we went nine and one during that time without plumber and that kind of kept us focused on just being process oriented and like okay this is the team we have how can we get the most out of this team and how is this going to help us get ready for the tournament so a lot of factors kind of made it a lot simpler than, yeah. than if we were undefeated and just smashing everybody um it would have been it might have been harder losing yeah. matches and then having um, the adversity we had, it really kept, kept our heads straight that whole time. Yeah. Yeah. During that the time I was, it. yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. During that time, I was really excited to see uh McClure kind of work her safe self back. And she just, well, one, just being a, a short, I mean, she's what six, one, still pretty good height. She's six. She's about six feet. Okay. Yeah. But still kind of the short outside hitter. Um, yeah. Kind of always carries that, that chip on her shoulder and, always always just fights no matter what she's a baller no. man. I, you know we try to we try to get her off the floor last year for kip yeah and we were just better with her out there and kendall yeah. knew it was cool kendall she knew and I, when kendall came back and she was healthy she's like you're gonna keep the same group out there right and i was like yeah kendall i'm sorry because she was starting for us before i'm like yeah this group's just balling this team can win it and she's like i know i see it it's all good like it was it was really cool but because just megan was then it hurt her it hurt Kip to say that, of course, because she wanted to play. But, I mean, Megan was just balling at the end. She was so yeah. good at the end of the year. And it's really refreshing to hear from, was she 6'5", Kip? 6'5". Yeah, 6'5", and 10'10". She flies, you know. She's armpits above the net when she blocks. And But yeah. 
we just volleyball is volleyball. You, there's a lot of ways to yeah. score. There's a lot of ways to play. Yeah. So it's awesome that a top recruit freshman still has that mentality. And I'm sure that's something you value in, in the players you recruit anyway, that team mentality. Well, and it's also, that's passed down from everybody, right? The whole mm -hmm. culture of our program is that way. And, you know, when you're like legacy was about that, like you gotta, you gotta be unselfish and what's best for the team. And she's a, she's a special human being like, and she's bought into the culture, like all the team is. We have a really, really special group of people right now. Yeah. Can't wait to see them. Me either. And, I'm curious what they're going to look like. And lastly, uh, what, you know, the, the channel Elevate Yourself is all about having that underdog mentality, whether or not you're not, in, in, you're an underdog. Um, so do you have any a short story or any underdog tidbits, like a philosophy or a mantra or a story you want to share to kind of inspire people? Oh, um, no, I'm not like that. I have, I'd had, to, I'd had to think about that before. I'm sorry. I didn't think about that before. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I don't, I don't know that I have like a one that comes to mind. That's going to be inspirational. That's not okay. really my thing. I'm not like a motivational, inspirational speaker. <laughs> I'm just like this all the time. Um, yeah, I can't, I mean, I, I, there's some players that come to mind. Like one of my, one of my favorite players was Lorda Bruller who um, was a 5'11 outside for us with, the, with Illinois when we started to come and everyone else is recruiting her as a DS because they know I'm yeah. she could hit and um, she really wanted to attack and I think that's the only reason we got her actually it was like Penn State wanted to be a libero and Wisconsin wanted her to be a DS libero and we were like no come be our stud and um, she is an incredible competitor and worked really hard and changed her entire game. Her first, I remember her first big match when we played Penn state, she had uh, 18 kills and 18 errors and 12 of those errors were being blocked by Alicia glass. Who was my assistant coach right now uh -huh. on the Penn state team. But by the end of her time, you know, we, we ended Penn state's win streak uh, of like 56 games. And she was, she had something like 20 kills in that match. And, she had 315 for that season. It was just incredible. And she just worked her way, her way into a game. And I think the coolest part about that is that everyone the whole time was telling her she couldn't and she did. Yeah. You know, she proved everyone wrong. And uh, Unfortunately, she tore ACL at the end of her senior year. Or um, We had a good shot. That was probably my best team at Illinois, actually, with her and Barch and Ward as the, as the pins. Um, but she was a pretty special. It was fun to be a part of that. Uh, that's a great story. I'm not sure that fits. Yeah, I'm not sure it fits exactly. But – that's that's what came, comes to mind right now. So that that definitely fits, and I think it requires a, a coach to to affirm somebody that it's okay to to have that chip on your shoulder and to fight and to be a short hitter and and teach them how to play that way. Um, actually, just had a a talk with a, a local college consulting volleyball consulting um, company here, and the other question we always get that I passed on to him was, "Am I too short to play?" outside hitter or how tall do I need to be or what do the colleges look for? And he said, after interviewing a lot of the top men's games, even in, in uh, division one, he said, well, I want both. I want a tall one and a short one. Yeah. You, know, you want different tempos. You want different styles. You want to push each other in practice. So everyone gets to see the variety, um, but they both offer the strengths, you know? So. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think looking at the height, I mean, we have a tall team. It's because they're great volleyball players. Like it's because they're tall, you know? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I would take another Megan in a second. Yeah. She's won two national championships. She's played big roles in that. You know, I think, um, yeah, everyone looks at the plumber and she's this giant, you know, she's 6'6 six, six and she's, you know, a warrior out there. Megan's had every, was every bit as important to us in our success. Yeah. yeah. Is there any uh, other advice you want to give to some of the coaches listening out there? Well, if I had to give one piece of advice, this might be a little bit longer than you expected. Is that that's that's, okay? that's perfectly fine. Okay. I would say this is this, I would say this to both athletes and coaches. Don't let volleyball be who you are. It's not your identity. Mm. Like your identity is you're Donnie. I'm Kevin. What coaching is what I do. It's not who I am. And as a player, it's volleyball is not what I do. I then the, the danger in that when you attach your identity to the sport or to really anything, you know, like, there's days you're going to have bad days in that sport. I'm going to do a bad job coaching someday. And, and the danger, especially as an athlete, is when you're in it, if your identity is attached to that and you play poorly, then all of a sudden you're not okay. Like something's wrong with you as a person. And 
that's not true. You just had a bad day. Or just, just keeping that separation of your identity from, from the sport, whether that's coaching or volleyball or being a parent or being a student or being anything, I think is important. Like there's a lot of things that you do. It doesn't mean that's who you are. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think that separation is really important. And from the coaching side, when, when coaches allow their identity to wrap up in being a coach, when things go poorly, they usually take it out on their athletes and that's not healthy for the athletes. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we keep that separation. So there's my bit of advice that comes to mind right now. Top of my that's head. awesome. Uh, that's, that's, that's really great. Um, it's when I, when I was single coaching and now that I'm married, I do find it a lot easier to handle losses because one, I have someone great to come home to, to process yeah. it, but to also remind me that your coaching stops at the door and you are still a great person and, and you're someone that I care about. And yeah. beyond that, that's so much bigger. So, Huey, Hugh says this all the time that losing is an occupational hazard. It's true, but then that's all it is. It's not. It's not. Um, doesn't change who you are as a person. One of my favorite moments is uh, we lost a match to North Carolina. It was really tough, and my wife just, I was, I was in it, and I was struggling. It was early on in, at Illinois, and she just puts Quinn, my my um, my young, my oldest child, in front of me and says you you need her right now and i just mm. grabbed her and she's just looking at me smiling and it was like just gave me perspective oh, my yeah. wife's good about that so but i think that separation is easier said than done right mm -hmm. it's easier said than done so yeah um but it, but it's important yeah that's great advice thank you so much thank for you. that happy to share well thanks again for taking your time and um this is definitely such a special talk and sharing lots of great information and stories that we can inspire all the people in the volleyball world to at the end of the day just be the best version of themselves and that that's that's really the ultimate goal and the ultimate experience that we're trying to achieve regardless of whether you're a player coach or whatever you're doing cool thanks Tony. so yeah thanks for having me on thanks for letting me reminisce about 1990s uh men's volleyball that was fun oh man i would love to the whole steve timmons all that I, yeah. there's nobody to talk to around that yeah i have to, really people don't know that i mean they they'll they'll t talk about his hair and and then but then most volleyball players i know that are my age they you know the eric sato that whole yeah. group um andrea gianni six-time olympian i mean the, yeah yeah that's unheard of. Uh, Morocco really? Ruiz from, from, from Cuba. Yeah. Ne uh, Negral from Brazil was insane. That dude was insane. Um, yeah. Desnitz, no, Desnitz, uh, Despania from uh, Cuba. Cuba was gnarly. Oh, Desnitz man. was from Germany. He was in the middle from Germany. Not a lot of people know about him. He was ridiculous. Yeah, I, I mean, that guy, 1960s a too, like Rundle and the, the Suarez and all those guys, man, those guys balled back in the day. And there's yeah. a couple of Russians. I can't remember their names right now, but you know, I like the history of volleyball is fun. It's fun to look back and see what those guys were about. What's crazy is seeing those photos. And then I, I cringe when I look at the, the floors they played on and the shoes they played in like the, I mean, back then it was considered athletic shoes, right? Our technology is so much better, but yeah. like we wear them for fashion now. Just thick, solid rubber. Yeah, they're basically vans with yeah. like with quitter socks on. And uh -huh. like, yeah, no, it was, yeah. Can you imagine? Well, did you see them? Did you watch the Michael Jordan? Are you watching those doc, the doc? Like everyone's watching the Last Dance stuff? Yeah, first couple of episodes. Uh -huh. So in one of the episodes, he wears the old, the first Jordans in a basketball game. He says his feet are just torn up. <laughs> like, so like, I think like, the t he's like, he talks about how the technology's changed so much. So yeah. Anyway, anyway. Oh man. And I, I know you still probably prefer those long sleeve jerseys, huh? With the collar. I like the long sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The collar. The, I'm glad the collar went away. I don't, we don't miss that. That's, those are terrible. Oh, the man. cotton jerseys that would just hang and soak up. And technology is so much better now. So I better go. There's a dump truck coming right over my, my fence. You're not going to be able to hear me right now. <laughs> okay. So, uh, all right, no man. problem. Thanks a lot, good chat with you. Yeah, take you care, too. man. Later. Take care.